Once during the summer month, my younger brother Kyle, who had been living in South America for the past three years and even managed to start his own small business there, wrote to me. Besides, he finally found a girlfriend with whom he decided to formalize the relationship. Before this, he always preferred being in casual relationships and never got too attached to anyone. And now he sent me a postcard saying he was planning to visit us and stay for about a week or two if possible. Unlike Kyle, I had been married for a long time, and my wife Marie and I had two wonderful sons growing up. The elder, Michael, was already 15, and the younger, Sammy, was 12, but they had almost identical tastes and preferences and always managed to get along, although sometimes they teased each other like children. Marie was sometimes surprised because among her peers, families with boys often led to frequent fights or arguments. But it was a bit different for us. I always tried my best in raising them because both our parents had taught us, my brother and me, to live peacefully and avoid unnecessary conflicts. I informed the whole family about Kyle's visit during dinner, and everyone was genuinely happy that he would come to visit us. But the only inconvenience for my sons during this period was that they would have to share a room. The younger one took this rule less painfully, but Michael was a bit upset. I understood him since he was at an age where he wanted more personal space. However, after dinner, I talked to him, and as usual, my words had an effect, and he promised to endure until the guests left. The day Kyle's plane was supposed to land, I went to the airport to meet him. I'd gotten there a little early, and while I waited, I was mostly looking at the people walking by, and for some reason it seemed to me for a moment that something was wrong, as if the world around me had changed somehow. The waiting time passed quickly, and soon I could hear and see Kyle waving at me. I hurried over to him with a hug, because I'd missed him so much in three years. And when I got to him, I noticed that he hadn't flown in alone. There was a young Latin American woman next to him, very beautiful. Kyle barely had time to greet me before he started introducing me to his companion. She was his wife, whom I had seen in photos he sent me before, but today I saw her for the first time in person. Earlier, somehow there was no time to fly to them, or them to us, and even at their wedding I did not have a chance to visit, as they just quietly signed, marking the event only in a very small circle. But it didn't matter to me, I was just glad that my brother was happy and could finally come to visit us. We headed straight to my house where Marie had already set up a festive table and was getting ready to welcome the guests along with the children. Kyle didn't come empty-handed, first of all, he brought excellent alcohol to the table, made where he now lived. Give it a try, he said. You'll love it instantly, and you'll never want to drink anything else. Oh, Sammy, how you've grown, he lifted the little one, but soon put him back down as the child weighed much more than when Kyle last saw him. He tousled Michael's hair and expressed how happy he was to see him. The brother and his wife also brought some gifts for the children, which they immediately started examining, and we decided not to force the kids to sit at the table with the adults. After sending the children to their room with new toys and dessert, we chatted for about two hours, sipping the alcohol my brother brought. I realized it was more of a homemade spirit, quite strong indeed. After a while, our conversation became very relaxed, and I'd even say we all got too comfortable, with Kyle acting very uninhibitedly and not holding back and complimenting my wife. Yet, Ruth, his wife, seemed oblivious to it all. Sometimes my brother's behavior bothered me, but I attributed it to the alcohol's effect and didn't reproach him in any way. Kyle and Ruth went out, while Marie headed to the kitchen. Meanwhile, I decided to browse the news feed on my phone and didn't notice when I blacked out. I didn't dream of anything specific, just some random thoughts that occasionally flickered, but it felt like they were all happening in reality. Then, I opened my eyes. I saw the ceiling above me, and my temples throbbed with a pulsating ache. Recalling the earlier events, I realized that the alcohol was indeed stronger than I had assumed, and those last few drinks were probably unnecessary. Nonetheless, I decided to go to the bedroom and continue resting there, as the couch wasn't particularly comfortable. It was half past two according to the clock, I looked around and found no one. The light was dim, and the house was quiet, it seemed like everyone had dispersed to their rooms and fallen into a deep sleep. I reached the room quite swiftly, albeit occasionally stumbling over furniture in the darkness. Upon entering, I saw Marie already lying in bed, turned away from me, almost entirely covered by the blanket. I didn't want to wake her, so I quietly lay down beside her. Then, 
I heard a faint moan from her, uttered in her sleep. Instinctively, I placed my hand on her waist and lightly ran it along her side to help her feel safe. I always did this when she had a bad dream, and these movements usually eased her sleep. But this time, I felt Marie beginning to wake up. Sorry, dear. I didn't mean to wake you, I murmured to her. She, without rushing, turned to face me and said, What? It seemed to me that I heard a voice that wasn't my wife's, and again, I thought it might be due to the alcohol. Still, I wanted to be sure, so I turned my head toward her. By then, she had also started turning toward me, and when the blanket slipped from her head, I saw that the person in the bed next to me wasn't Marie at all. Damn! I exclaimed, jumping off the bed. Then I felt for the switch on the nightstand and turned on the night lamp. What are you doing here? In my bed lay Ruth, wearing just a thin shirt, and she seemed rather comfortable. But upon seeing me, she didn't react in surprise like I did. Instead, she remained completely calm. Brian, what's wrong? She asked. What's wrong? What are you doing here? Where's my wife? And why aren't you with my brother? I looked around as if my brother and wife were supposed to be somewhere around here. What the hell is happening? Oh, calm down. They're probably sleeping somewhere too. We all drink quite a bit. Just lie down and sleep. We'll figure it out in the morning. What do you mean, figure it out in the morning? I couldn't understand her logic and began getting ready to search for Marie. She must have been somewhere in the house for sure. I left the bedroom and started scanning the hallway walls. My thoughts were still a bit fuzzy, and I felt the heaviness of a hangover. But I couldn't just leave things as they were and proceeded, listening intently for any sound. Ruth called out to me again, asking me not to worry, but I ignored her and headed towards the room assigned to Kyle. Initially, I didn't immediately think my wife would be there, I just wanted my brother to take his wife with him. When I entered, I saw Marie lying on the bed. My brother was nowhere to be found, I hadn't even considered where he might be. Marie, wake up, I approached her and gently shook her shoulder. She mumbled something in her sleep at first, then opened her eyes. But upon seeing me, she reacted with mild shock, as if she expected to see someone else entirely. Brian, she asked in a drowsy voice, rubbing her eyes. Marie, what are you doing here? What happened at all? I woke up in the living room, and in the house. Oh. Don't worry, she sat up and looked around. We probably had too much to drink. Did you check on the kids? Are they asleep? At that moment, I somehow wasn't up for it. I knew they were smart guys and wouldn't engage in any nonsense, but what bothered me more was the chaos that had occurred among the four of us and where Kyle had disappeared to. Marie got up from the bed and, glancing around, led me out of the room, suggesting we go to our bedroom. Ruth was still there, and Marie politely escorted her out. But I was still concerned about where Kyle was. Leaving my wife to get ready for bed, I wandered around the house to find him. On my way, I peeked into the boys' room, they were already fast asleep, so I continued. No matter how much I roamed the house, I couldn't find Kyle. I even bumped into Ruth again, who had gone to the kitchen for some water. When she mentioned he might have gone outside to smoke, I realized I could use some fresh air too and headed outside. The night was moonless, and the porch was only lit by a couple of streetlights hanging under the roof. I noticed my brother in the farthest corner. He leaned against the railings, deep in thought. It seemed he didn't even notice me approach until I called out to him. Oh, you also decided to smoke? He asked me, offering me a pack of his cigarettes. No, just came out. Tell me, how did it happen that your wife ended up in my room? You two were together the whole time. Oh man, you really had a lot to drink last night. You don't remember anything. Ruth and I had a little argument, and she went to sleep, must have mixed up the rooms. I stayed in the kitchen drinking and smoking, that's why I just came out. You seem a bit agitated? Yeah. How can I stay calm when there's something strange happening in the house? But I'm glad everything's cleared up. I sent Ruth to your room, so you can go to her. Kyle offered me another drink, but I didn't feel like it anymore, so I went to my wife. By morning, I was feeling better, maybe because I slept in a comfortable bed or perhaps the hangover was wearing off. But my head no longer hurt, and that pleased me. I had a few days off ahead, 
I specifically took time off work to spend more time with my brother. However, Marie couldn't leave her project in someone else's hands. When I went down to the kitchen, my wife had already prepared breakfast for everyone and was about to leave. Darling, maybe stay home today? I was a little worried about her condition, remembering how bad I felt last night. No, I can't. Besides, the director scheduled a meeting for today. I got a message in the morning. A bit inconvenient timing. I'll have to stay a bit longer today. You'll manage without me, right? Marie kissed me and headed towards the door. It seemed to me that she was even glad she had to stay at work longer. But why? What happened yesterday evening that affected her behavior like this? Kyle and Ruth hadn't left the room yet, it seemed they were still asleep. But I didn't need them. I went to Michael and decided to talk to him. I addressed him as an adult, hoping he could help me this time too. Listen, son. I wanted to talk to you about last night. Is Sammy awake? Yes, he's in the bathroom. So, what did you want to talk about? You understand that adults sometimes. In general. I wanted to ask, did you notice anything strange last night? For example. Anything, really. I get it. You blacked out and missed the interesting stuff? Okay, Dad, we actually stayed in the room, as you asked. But only. What is it, Michael? Dad, forgive us, we just wanted a joke. It wasn't even my idea. My son told me that the night before, he and Sammy, upon seeing Ruth, decided to set up a nanny cam in their room, hidden in a teddy bear. They just wanted to play a childish prank and observe the woman who was a bit different from us. I even understood them, they were growing boys, and such curiosity is normal at Michael's age. But I also didn't quite like that they chose to act like that, especially in our house. And the camera was still there. On one hand, I should have scolded the kids for such an act, considering what my brother and his wife might have been doing in there. But now, I was curious myself since I found my wife there yesterday. I hope the recording might clarify something, as Marie herself didn't want to talk about last night. Waiting until the relatives came out of the bedroom, I seized the moment and retrieved the bear from there. I couldn't immediately watch it as Kyle literally followed me everywhere. But later, I managed to find some privacy in the office and started watching. I didn't even imagine what to expect from that recording and thought I'd probably see my drunk wife collapsing into sleep. But what I saw there fundamentally changed my attitude toward both my wife and my brother. The first shots were of Kyle and Ruth. They were in bed for a while, and after a few minutes they were arguing, I don't even know what it's about. But then Ruth walked out, and soon my wife walked into the room. At first she and Kyle were just talking, but the topic of their conversation was unpleasant enough for me. I could make out them talking about something that had happened between them three years ago, before he left for another country. As I listened, I realized that my wife and brother had betrayed me, years ago, and had pretended to be loving and innocent all along. But that wasn't all. I continued to watch the tape and saw that these two had decided to resume their relationship again. They weren't even embarrassed that I was in the house and could wake up at any minute and find them. And where was Ruth at that moment? Or did that lady know all about it, and that's why she'd taken refuge in our room? I had a few answers at that point, but I had even more questions. Realizing how badly I had been deceived and taken advantage of, I felt a surge of anger and a desire for revenge. The freak was now walking around my house and staring shamelessly into my eyes, so I didn't wait a second longer and went to him. Overflowing with anger, I flew out of the office and nearly bumped into my son, who was already heading down for breakfast. He saw my furious mood and asked what had happened. In a fit of rage, I almost spilled out everything I had found out to him. But just in time, I managed to stop myself, realizing that Michael, though already a grown boy, might not be ready to know such truth yet. Pulling myself together, I simply told my son it was time for breakfast. Of course, with the children around, I couldn't bring myself to confront my brother, though I was barely containing it. Moreover, I wondered how he could do this to me, as we had always been close, once swore never to hurt each other. And here I find out he betrayed me years ago. Did this happen even earlier? He used to visit us often back then, and we'd go on joint walks in the forest, even camping. Could their betrayal have lasted this long, and was I such a fool, loving them both, 
that I simply didn't notice? And now, this cursed recording. Perhaps it would have been better if the boys hadn't thought of doing it, and I would never have known anything? But living without knowing the truth, I also considered wrong. Taking the flash drive from the camera, I returned to the kitchen where relatives were still having breakfast and suggested to my brother that we go for a ride. He was slightly surprised because until then, we had planned to stay home, watch the game with a beer, or share stories of what had happened to us over the years. But I insisted on my proposal, and it seemed like they all noticed my grim mood, but I didn't care what they thought. I just wanted to take my brother away from the kids and have a man-to-man -man talk. Kyle kept asking where we were going, but I didn't answer him, just saying it would be a surprise. Although maybe my brother suspected that I already knew everything, at some point, it seemed that way to me. But then he continued his chatter and even suggested a few places we could visit. We stopped outside the city. I got out of the car, still unable to believe this was happening to me. Kyle followed me. But there's nothing here. What did you want to show me? He asked innocently. Show? You've already shown me. How could you? You were my brother. What are you talking about, bro? Kyle still pretended innocence. What? Are you still asking? I know everything, Kyle. About you and Mary. Oh, well, since you put it that way. Now Kyle changed his expression, and instead of apologies, which I at least expected from him, he just looked at me slyly and even chuckled. That infuriated me even more. I was angry before, but I hoped I could still control myself, and if my brother sincerely repented, I would have tried to forgive him. But apparently, he hadn't been my brother for a long time. I pushed aside all the other feelings I once had for him and now saw only an enemy and a traitor before me. I lunged at him with my fists, wanting to vent all my anger on him. But Kyle wasn't weak either and began defending himself. We both received a lot of blows from each other, not saying a word, our glances said it all. For several minutes, we fought and struggled, and those moments felt so long to me, as if an hour had passed already. Maybe it was because it was a fight with my brother, or maybe I was just sad because my wife's lover turned out to be my brother. With this thought, I delivered a decisive blow to his jaw, so strong that he simply blacked out. I felt so exhausted myself that I just sat down on the ground and leaned against the car. I just wanted to forget everything, but I couldn't. After sitting like that for a few minutes, I returned to the car. Kyle was still unconscious. I didn't bother to bring him to his senses. I just left him there and drove back home. Though I didn't particularly want to go home either, there were unfinished matters there. Arriving home, I gave the boys some pocket money and asked them to walk around for a few hours. The older one was initially a bit surprised by my generosity, but then it seemed like he understood and took his brother with him, saying they would only be back closer to the evening. And when they left, I called my wife and asked her to return home urgently. Marie started asking me in response what had happened, but I didn't answer, just repeated that she should come back as soon as possible. Then I approached Ruth and decided to have a serious conversation with her. It seemed to me that she knew much more than it appeared at first glance because she had remained absolutely calm so far, as if nothing had happened. Ruth, tell me honestly. How well do you know my brother? What connects you to him? And don't tell me it's just pure and innocent feelings between you. I sat opposite her in the living room while she was flipping through magazines, settled on the couch. What are you talking about? She distracted herself from reading and turned to me, her smile, as usual, not leaving her face. Do you have something specific in mind? Yes, Ruth. I'm talking about tonight. Did you know that Mary went to see my brother? You were with him shortly before that. What were you arguing about? Oh, so you heard us? Why ask then? We thought you passed out after the cachaça. Kyle said this drink is out of your league. Don't mess with my head. Answer my question. Did you know he was with Mary? Well, I knew. So what? He told me about it back in Brazil. Ruth stood up, walked across the room, and stopped by the window, looking out. And did you yourself know what your brother was like? She asked me in response, still not turning to face me. What do you mean? I grew up with him. How could I not know him? Oh, of course. Blind faith in brothers. 
He wouldn't have confessed to you about Mary or what he was really doing in Brazil. You didn't know that he had gotten involved with drugs, thinking he could run that business. But it didn't work out for him. They caught him within the first few months, and he got jailed. He spent two and a half years pacing the cell there. What? I couldn't believe what I was hearing, although, considering recent events, I no longer knew what to believe. You're lying. He would have told me. Well, yes, Ruth turned to face me. Just like he told you about his relationship with Mary. We met before he got out. During that time, he managed to learn a few things and decided to try his luck again. And things went quite well for him afterward. But he still made enemies and now owes some dangerous people. Very dangerous people. What does that have to do with this? What about my wife? Nothing at all. He came because he wanted to retrieve some valuable items he said were inherited from your granddad and kept here. And he took me along just to show off, I suppose. Although I've wanted to see America for a while. But wait, he sent me your photos. Does that concern you? Ruth returned to the couch and sat down again. Listen, now that his secret is out, I apparently have nothing else to do here, although the house is quite cozy. I'll go pack my things. Don't worry, I'll find my way out. And you're just going to leave your husband like that? I was still in some shock. I beg you. You wonder why you weren't invited to the wedding? There was no wedding. Ruth smiled broadly again and left the room. Now I hated her too, although she, essentially, revealed the whole truth about the brother, who turned out to be not only a traitor but also a liar and a criminal. I stayed at home until Mary arrived. Ruth had already left before my wife came. I was overwhelmed with despair and anger again. And I didn't know how to contain myself, not to lash out at my wife for her betrayal. When she entered the house and started asking me what happened and if everything was okay with the kids, I couldn't hold back, and my first response was a hard slap that immediately made Mary fall to the floor. Brian, what are you doing? She started but apparently understood that I already knew her secret. How could you? I loved you all these years. I gave you everything, and you. How long have you been cheating on me with him? I ask, how long? Are the kids even mine? I leaned over her, but Mary just cried and didn't even dare to get up from the floor. I grabbed her hand and dragged her to the couch. She stood up a little so she wouldn't drag herself across the floor, but she still stumbled the whole way, and one of her shoes was off one foot. When I dumped her on the couch, I sat across from her and stared at her with a glare. I'm sorry, was all Mary managed to say. I hoped she would say something more, but it seemed she didn't want to justify herself. I wanted to continue questioning her, but at that moment, the front door slammed shut, and I heard heavy footsteps, my brother's. He barged into the room where we were sitting and looked at me with some malice. From his disheveled appearance, Marie even flinched, seeing his clothes stained with dirt, mixed in places with blood. But apparently, he didn't know yet that Ruth had already told me about his plans and was trying to play the repentant brother. Listen, bro things didn't work out between us. I know I was wrong. Forgive me. I just couldn't resist, your wife. Don't you dare even talk about her, I stood up and walked towards him. You've lied so much that soon you'll confuse yourself. Speak up. Why did you come here? And don't you dare lie anymore. I already know about Ruth. Oh, he smirked. So that bitch spilled the beans. Damn it. She promised to keep quiet. Damn it. Well then, let's be straight. Yes, bro. I've always envied you. Dad always loved you more. But why? You always got everything best, even Grandpa's inheritance. Everything just for you. And now I came here to get what rightfully belongs to me. Nothing here belongs to you. I retorted and punched him again. From his tone, I realized my brother was only now being honest with me, all those years before he was just pretending. But what stopped him before from taking the antique coin collection? What was he waiting for? Another fight erupted between us, and amidst the punches, when I found a moment and asked him about it, he said he wanted me to feel unwanted, that someone loved me less than him. And I even felt a bit sorry for this envious liar who just wanted attention. 
When I stopped beating him, Kyle also calmed down a bit and sat on a chair. Seems like he was already exhausted for the day. But I didn't want to just fight him anymore. After all, he was still my brother. So, I turned to Marie again, who had been sitting on the couch, watching everything with horror. I already knew she had been deceiving me for a long time, but it was important for me to know if my children, Michael and Sammy, were mine. I loved them so much that if they turned out not to be mine, I don't even know what I would have done. But Marie began swearing by everything that they were mine. And that her affair with Kyle started just a few months before he left for another country. It turned out, even then, he intended to use Marie to get the collection. But she refused back then because she was afraid of what I might do to both her and him later. And you thought these coins meant more to me than my own family? What do you take me for? I asked her after she told me everything. Kyle, if you want, take these damned coins. But just know, both you and Marie. You're dead to me tonight. If not for the recording, maybe you'd have pulled off your plan, Kyle. But as you can see, luck didn't favor you this time. I went to the study, took out a few coins from a box with soft padding, brought them to him, and then just threw the box at him like a dog, causing it to open, and several coins rolled out onto the floor. He greedily crawled on the floor, gathering them. When he collected them all, still glowering at us from under his brow, he left the room. I returned to my chair and stared at my wife again. She looked at me with some confusion. You just gave him the coins like that? Yes. Gave them. Maybe they'll bring him some happiness. I've already lost mine, several years ago when you betrayed me. Marie guiltily lowered her eyes. For a couple of minutes, she sat and looked at the floor, then just got up and rushed to my feet, begging me to forgive her. Now she was saying that Kyle had forced her, threatening to reveal her secret if she didn't agree. What other damn secret? I asked indifferently, as I had already learned enough today and couldn't imagine what else could shock me. And then Marie told me she had another child, an older one. She gave birth to him before she met me, but she was only 17 then and couldn't keep him, so she gave him to other people. She accidentally blurted it out to Kyle when, during one of the holidays, she had a bit too much to drink, and he threatened to tell me that all these years she had been secretly sending money to her son. By the end of her story, Kyle appeared on the horizon again. He had changed clothes and was packing his suitcase to leave our house. He didn't say anything and silently left. I didn't say anything to him either, only when he left, I told Marie to start packing her things too because I couldn't stand her in the house anymore. Not because she had another child, but because of all the lies and betrayal she committed. About a month later, after these nightmarish events had ended, and Marie had left our home, my brother called me and immediately started scolding me. When I asked him what was wrong again, he said that the coins I gave him turned out to be cheap fakes. And because of that, he got into big trouble. But I told him that the trouble he got into wasn't because of that, but when he decided to abandon his family and brother out of greed and envy. Of course, I knew the coins were not real. I had made copies long ago because I was afraid someone would decide to rob our house, and I kept the real coins in the safest place, buried them under our grandfather's tombstone. I wanted them to survive until my children grew up, and then I could share the inheritance with them, although now I doubted it, and thought maybe these cursed coins should just stay with Grandpa. After Kyle and Marie left, I talked to my children and told them the whole truth. I knew they would understand me, and I hoped they would never make such a mistake. Story 2 It's not about my spouse and me, our marriage has been happy for 14 years. Instead, this unfortunate incident involves my mother, a 59-year-old woman, and what she did to my father, who is 63 years old. So, it's not only young women who have affairs, sometimes, older women are involved too. My parents had a joyful marriage that lasted over 38 years until everything changed last Thursday, around three years ago. My parents retired to Arizona, they purchased a lovely riverside home and a new diesel truck with a camper. They spend their time in Arizona from October to April, and the rest of the year, they embark on adventures, often traveling to cooler places like the mountains or the west coast. They also spend around four to six weeks with my family in the high elevation region of Utah. My husband has arranged complete RV hookups for them on our 16-acre property, including electricity, water, and septic connections. 
we thoroughly enjoy their company, and our kids love spending time with them too. Likewise, we love visiting their Arizona home. It's always a thrilling experience, especially with their boat and jet skis. We're even willing to go in the midsummer heat for the excitement. My brother and his family, who reside in Georgia, also make it a point to visit my parents at least once a year. Although they can't come as often as we do, they still make the effort. Until recent happenings, I could confidently state that my mom and dad had a perfect marriage. Both of my parents served as role models for my brother and me, and we built our own families based on the values they taught us. So, to give you a clear picture, our family life was about as ideal as it gets according to American Dream standards. Now let me explain how things took a turn. My parents were residents of a wonderful community in Arizona. Almost everyone there was friendly, except for this one woman. There was something about her that bothered me, but I couldn't quite pinpoint it. She just didn't sit right with me. For the sake of this story, we'll call her Josephine. Josephine, a 64-year-old divorcee who enjoys socializing and partying, was quite loud and in your face. Surprisingly, my mom hit it off with Josephine, and they developed a close friendship, a definite warning sign considering my mom isn't usually into parties and only drinks occasionally. Several of my mom's friends also formed bonds with Josephine despite her loud personality, they seemed to enjoy her company. On multiple occasions, I voiced my suspicions about Josephine to my mom, but she shrugged them off, assuring me that Josephine was harmless and had a heart of gold. This is where things began to take a negative turn. A few months ago, Josephine purchased a boat with some guidance from my dad, who also helped her learn how to operate it. Last Tuesday, around 6 p.m., my mom, Josephine, and another friend, whom I'll refer to as Jenny, decided to have happy hour drinks together. They took Josephine's boat to a local river bar, that's the second red flag. Their plan was to relax by the water, have a couple of drinks, and chat for a few hours. On that night, my dad shared with me that around 8 o'clock, mom gave him a call. She mentioned that they were extending their outing for another hour. Apparently, they had run into a friend of Josephine's and were heading to this person's house by the river for a bit. This raised another red flag, as mom was prolonging her time out, plus the identity of this friend was unknown. Nevertheless, dad didn't seem worried, and mom got back home shortly after 9. Everything seemed fine. Wednesday came and went without any unusual incidents. However, on Thursday, the three ladies planned to return to the bar for happy hour drinks on the patio. This marked the fourth red flag. As I mentioned before, mom wasn't typically a drinker, yet within a week, she had gone out twice for happy hour, enjoying drinks and socializing. This abrupt change in behavior was a significant cause for concern. On that evening, my dad and Jenny's husband had plans to work on their cars, so the fact that the ladies were going out wasn't a concern. They left on the boat around 6.30 p.m. with the intention to be back by 9 p.m. at the latest. Around 8 p.m., after Dad and Jenny's husband had finished their car work, Dad returned home, took a shower, and noticed he had a missed call from Mom. Curious, he dialed her number to return the call. Mom explained that Josephine and Jenny wanted to stay out longer, but she wanted to head home. Agreeing to pick her up, Dad drove to the bar and brought her back home. During the short ride, Mom appeared normal, but looking back, Dad noted that he did most of the talking while Mom listened. Upon reaching home, Mom knelt in front of Dad and embraced his legs, her head against his stomach. Initially, Dad thought she might be getting playful for intimate time, but he soon realized she was crying. He lifted her up, held her, and asked her what was wrong. That's when Mom confessed to Dad that she had been unfaithful. This confession caught him off guard, and he questioned her with a surprised, Come again? The second confirmation after hearing Mom's confession, Dad was utterly shocked and just held her while she clung to him, crying heavily. Can you believe it? They had spent 38 years married, a grand total of 40 years together, and their marriage had been flawless. And now she was admitting to cheating on him. He must have been completely stunned. Slowly, reality sank in, and he suggested she'd take a shower and that they would talk things through in the morning. But mom wouldn't let go, she held onto him. He guided her to the bathroom where she showered. When she emerged, he informed her that she should sleep in a different bedroom. Although she pleaded for him to stay in the same bed, he stood his ground and calmly informed her that they would address the situation in the morning. 
Throughout the night, mom struggled to find sleep, repeatedly coming to the bedroom door to request a conversation with dad. He continued to encourage her to rest, promising that they would discuss everything when morning came. Eventually, around 5.30 a.m., she managed to fall asleep, only to wake up at 8 a.m. and discover that dad and his camper were gone. Little did she know he had moved all his personal belongings into the camper overnight, symbolizing his choice to separate from her. He had reached a point where he was done with her, a strong reaction to her unfaithfulness despite their four decades of history together. Dad was handling the situation with expertise. He skillfully moved his belongings without disturbing Mom. Their bedroom has a sliding door leading to the patio, which allowed him to discreetly take his clothes and personal items out through the back door, load them into the camper, and leave. Mom began calling him, but he didn't answer at first. Eventually, he sent her a text message that declared their official separation as of 6 a.m. on April 9th, which was the same morning. At this moment, Mom completely fell apart. She called Dad again, and this time he picked up. He calmly reiterated what he had texted her. He informed Mom that he was filing for divorce and that until the divorce was finalized, he would be living in the camper. Mom pleaded with him to talk and give her a chance to explain, but he showed no interest. He firmly stated that she would hear from his lawyer once he had won before ending the call. Dad mentioned that he had reached out to Jenny's husband. Remember, Jenny was the friend who joined Mom and Josephine for the outing. He informed Jenny's husband about what had transpired with Mom. I'm not exactly sure how, but Jenny's husband discovered her own cheating and locked her out of their house. As a result, Jenny is currently staying with Josephine while they work out their issues. After speaking with Mom, Dad contacted my brother and me to deliver the news. We were taken aback initially, assuming it was a prank. When the reality of the situation sank in, I found myself shedding tears. Since then, Mom has been emotionally devastated. Throughout the past week, she has been driving to every campground in the area, searching for Dad. She's covered more than 1,800 miles. While my brother and I are aware of Dad's whereabouts, we've made a promise to not share this information with her. Both my brother and I fully support Dad in this ordeal and want to honor his wishes as the one wronged in this situation. However, we're deeply concerned about Mom's well-being. She's not eating or sleeping, driving around frantically in her attempts to locate Dad. We're afraid she might get into an accident, experience a heart attack, or even pose a danger to herself, given her repeated statements about not wanting to go on without Dad. Now we're grappling with the dilemma. Should my brother and I disclose Dad's location to alleviate Mom's distress? My stance is that we shouldn't, as Dad explicitly requested his privacy, and sharing his location could erode his trust in us. We should respect his plea for privacy. We could inform Mom of Dad's location with the assurance that she wouldn't approach him. This might offer her some solace, yet there's a risk of harming our rapport with Dad if he discovers it. Our priority is to stand by Dad, who was taken by surprise due to his wife's actions, and to uphold his trust. Our obligation is to honor Dad's wish while extending our support to him. I understand that we should fully back Dad, as Mom's actions led to this situation, and she must now confront the repercussions. Yesterday evening, Mom was in the St. George area searching for Dad. For those unfamiliar, St. George is in southwest Utah. I convinced Mom to drive up to our house and stay with us for a few nights. She agreed and is expected to arrive this afternoon. Over the past 10 days, there has been a significant change in the situation. Mom came to my house looking visibly distressed and mentioned feeling unwell. We had a brief conversation, everyone greeted her, and then we let her rest in one of the bedrooms. However, an hour later, my youngest daughter started screaming for me to come to the bedroom. When I arrived, I found my mom bent over in pain, clutching her lower abdomen and pelvic area. She was immobilized, so my husband carried her to the car, and we rushed her to the emergency room. She was in extreme pain, sweating profusely, and seemed to have a high fever. While at the hospital, the doctor suspected some kind of infection, possibly a urinary tract infection, and ordered tests. They also provided treatment for her severe dehydration. It turned out that mom had contracted a sexually transmitted disease from the man she had been involved with. Fortunately, it was one that could be cured with antibiotics. The doctor suggested that mom stay overnight in the hospital until her fever went down and her overall condition improved. However, even after 48 hours, 
there was no noticeable change. This is when the situation took a turn for the worse. The doctor mentioned the possibility of her having a drug-resistant form of the STD that has been spreading in recent years. So, they put her on a combination of powerful antibiotics. After five days, her fever finally broke and her condition became stable. She was discharged from the hospital yesterday. Throughout her hospital stay, mom repeatedly inquired about dad. She wanted to know if he had reached out to check on her. I told her the truth, that he hadn't made any calls, not even once, but that I was providing him with daily updates. My family and I visited her multiple times every day to ensure she wasn't alone for extended periods. However, this caused her to become extremely saddened. Now back at our home, mom appears to be recovering physically. She has been sending numerous texts and making frequent calls to dad since her arrival. Out of frustration, she expressed, after being together for 40 years, you'd think he'd at least communicate with me. Hearing this, I was so angry that I lost control and said, if you hadn't messed around, none of this would have happened. This is all your fault, you've tore our family apart. Although this statement held undeniable truth, I immediately regretted saying it and apologized to her. She broke down and started crying, clinging to me. We talked for more than two hours, and she finally opened up. It turns out that the man she had been involved with was a 28-year-old construction worker who was working on a project in the area. This guy was pursuing a relationship with a 59-year-old married woman. What a disrespectful person. He, along with two friends, had rented a trailer by the river for six months instead of staying in a hotel. Now comes the disturbing part. According to mom, she had only spoken to the guy on Tuesday while Josephine and Jenny were getting involved with the other two guys. Yes, you heard that correctly. However, when she met up with him again on Thursday, she found herself so enticed by his advances that she gave in to her desires and became intimate with him. Hearing this disgusted me. It's incredibly unsettling, something I never could have imagined even in my most outrageous thoughts, that my own mom would engage in such behavior. I continued to push the topic, even though mom grew increasingly uncomfortable. She clearly didn't want to discuss it any further, but I insisted. I kept asking how she could betray daddy like that, and all she could manage to say was that she honestly didn't know. She quickly regretted her actions as soon as things started between her and the guy. Reflecting on it and sharing this with you just gives me a really queasy feeling. I'm so thankful she confessed to dad. Poor dad, imagine if she hadn't and ended up passing the STD to my unsuspecting sweet dad. That would have been a truly awful turn of events, a devastating tragedy even. Mom still holds onto the belief that Dad will come back. However, he's resolute in his decision, and he's not known for changing his mind. Mom plans to leave on Saturday to resume her search for Dad. She intends to visit all the campsites in the Southwest, unaware of what awaits her. On Friday, there's something I know that she doesn't, but I can't reveal it to her. Listen to this. Dad is actually planning to serve mom with divorce papers at my house. He wants her to have family around when he does it to ensure she has support. Friday is going to be a really difficult day, a tough one. I feel a bit guilty knowing what's coming, but I owe it to dad to assist him with this. Also, I need to be there for mom when she inevitably breaks down. I'll provide an update if anything significant occurs. For now, let's hope for the best. A significant period of time has gone by since my previous update, to be precise, it's been over 13 months. We're now in June of 2022. Mom and Dad are officially divorced, a fact that I still struggle to accept along with everything that has unfolded in their lives since then. Dad couldn't bring himself to forgive Mom for her affair. He's a resilient man, not someone who would easily overlook such a breach of trust. He chose to have no contact with Mom. In fact, the only time he encountered her after leaving in the camper was during the divorce proceedings. While I understand his emotions, I was surprised by how swiftly he cut ties with mom. Nevertheless, he ensured that the financial division was conducted fairly. Mom was treated more than fairly, he simply wanted to exit the marriage and move on from her. Though it's painful for me to express, I can empathize with his feelings of betrayal and lack of respect. Mom currently resides in a small apartment near us. As mentioned before, she used to own a beautiful house by the river in Arizona, complete with boats, jet skis, and a camper. 
She and Dad would travel across the country during summers, exploring coastlines and mountains. Yet now she lives in a town close to her daughter in a modest apartment. I can only imagine the remorse she must feel, having sacrificed so much for a fleeting moment of excitement, a fleeting happy hour in exchange for something even more damaging. I'll digress here because I want to underscore this aspect. From Dad's perspective, the divorce was swift and decisive, unlike Mom's experience. Following the divorce, Mom's health quickly declined. She was hospitalized due to bronchitis, dehydration, malnutrition, and severe depression. Her hospital stay lasted three days, during which she received treatment and was prescribed medication for her depression and anxiety. The medication seemed to have a positive effect on stabilizing her mental state and at least provided some relief. Sadly, she also received a diagnosis of a potential case of lupus, likely triggered by the stress of the divorce and the loss of my father. The doctor explained that intense stress can compromise the immune system and worsen conditions similar to lupus. Given her struggles with overcoming the STD and bacterial bronchitis, it's evident that her immune system is in a weakened condition. The doctor provided mom with specific advice on how to boost her immune system and manage her stress. She needs to actively focus on reducing stress and maintaining control over her stress levels. Over the past six months, there has been improvement, but she's not the same strong and composed woman she used to be. Mom used to exude strength and confidence, but now she appears fragile, shattered, and devoid of her former energy. A few months back, I managed to secure a job for her at a craft superstore where my friend works as a manager. She's been performing exceptionally well and has received praise as an outstanding employee. Hopefully, this job will help her find a sense of purpose. However, the reality remains somber. She has lost the luxury she once enjoyed, is taking prescription medication, and stress is actively taking a toll on her while she fights to control her emotions. And once again, she lives in a small apartment near me. At 59, she's returned to working in retail. Her life has undergone profound changes, to say the least. But let's shift the focus from my mom. Regarding dad, he's certainly making the most of his time. He appears to be relishing his newfound freedom as a wanderer, traveling wherever he desires in his camper. He has a deep fondness for the outdoors and exploring new places. In the last half year, He's begun dating a woman, and it seems their relationship is becoming more serious. Yet I advise him to be cautious due to his recent divorce from a 40-year marriage with mom. I've met her multiple times, and she's very pleasant and treats my dad with kindness. I don't want to sound negative, but I'm unsure how to express it without it sounding ironic. The thing is, she's significantly younger. They bond over their shared interest in travel, as she's a YouTube vlogger who explores different places. Over the past four months, Dad and she have been traveling all around the country, camping, and enjoying each other's company. While she hasn't featured Dad on her YouTube channel, she has mentioned him in several of her videos. It's clear they have a strong connection, and Dad personally told me that he's happier now than ever. Despite his happiness, he's made it clear to my brother and me that he has no intentions of marrying again. Interestingly, his girlfriend feels the same way. She had a previous marriage that didn't work out, and she's not keen on going through that again. Since they both love nature and outdoor activities, they seem like a perfect match. I think I've included all the details. Best regards. A caring and optimistic daughter. Story 2. I'm a 40-year-old guy, and my wife Miley is 38. We got married five years ago, but our love story started at my friend Noel's wedding. I was a groomsman, and Miley was one of the bridesmaids on that special day. During the ceremony, Miley's confident presence caught my eye as she elegantly wore a beautiful green maxi dress. I was so captivated by her that I ended up clumsily spilling cocktails on myself while looking at her. This comical mishap made Miley notice me, and we both burst into laughter. While laughing, she kindly offered to help me clean up the mess on my shirt. It was clear that I was attracted to her, even though my shyness held me back from making a move. But Miley, with her easygoing personality and stunning looks, took the initiative and started talking to me. Her charm and beauty were irresistible. Even though I used to doubt love at first sight, meeting Miley erased all my skepticism. The moment our eyes met, I just knew she was the one for me. 
As our relationship blossomed after Noelle's wedding, Miley then invited me to meet her parents. During that time, our commitment grew deeper, and we realized we wanted to spend our lives together. However, our journey hit a bump when Miley's dad expressed his concerns about our relationship. He strongly wanted his daughter to marry a wealthy businessman, which posed a challenge for our relationship. When I visited their home, I was surprised when Miley's father had the nerve to belittle me, calling me an average guy. He even insulted my financial situation, showing disapproval of his daughter marrying someone he considered to have a low income. It was painful as he compared my earnings to Miley's beauty, like she was a Hollywood actress. Even though I worked as a brand manager at a respected marketing agency and earned a decent income, his shallow comments angered me. I stood my ground, expressing my disappointment and reminding him that true value goes beyond money. Despite his self-centered behavior, Miley handled the situation well, showing her loyalty by supporting me and confronting her father. She chose to leave her parents' home and start a new chapter with me just a week later. We had a small ceremony to celebrate our marriage and exchanged vows, which made us very happy. Having such an understanding and supportive partner like my wife brought me immense joy, especially since Miley intentionally invited only her mother, excluding her father from the guest list. Our first year of marriage was filled with happiness and satisfaction. However, as time went on, I started noticing certain behaviors in Miley that resembled those of her father. Growing up, her parents had given her a lot of love, which led to her feeling entitled. She often demanded to be treated like royalty and expected me to follow her wishes without question. Any disagreement I had was dismissed as just an argument, and she expected me to obey her without hesitation. While shopping for furniture for our home, I realized that Miley didn't value my opinions. She consistently ignored my suggestions. When I mentioned that I preferred white sofas over green ones, she blew it out of proportion and got upset. Her tendency to get angry and throw fits over small things became clear once I accidentally bought chocolate ice cream instead of her favorite blueberry flavor, and she burst into tears. It was clear she wasn't used to hearing the word no. Without a job or career, she spent most of her time hanging out with friends and shopping. I realized that Miley had inherited her father's traits, but I wasn't willing to give in or blindly follow her demands. I told her that as a married couple, I had the right to express my opinions, and I expected her to act maturely if we wanted to have a successful marriage. I communicated that lacking mutual understanding and respect would make our marriage unworkable. Miley was surprised by my statement as she had never heard the word no before. Overwhelmed with emotions, she cried and sincerely promised to change her ways. Even though it was unfamiliar territory for her, she was committed to trying earnestly due to her deep love for me. Acknowledging her father's influence on her spoiled behavior, I chose to give her a chance for personal growth. Driven by my love for her, Miley began taking gradual steps to show her commitment to patience and kindness toward me. She got a part-time job and enrolled in a course to contribute to our lives responsibly rather than solely socializing with friends. She made an effort to join me when we met our mutual friends Noah and his wife Emily. While Emily had been Miley's friend since childhood, she contrasted significantly in personality and demeanor. Emily presented herself as composed, mature, and intelligent, creating a sharp distinction from Miley's previous behavior. As Noah was my closest friend, we frequently collaborated on various business ideas. This led to us visiting each other's homes often. With our strong dedication and hard work, Noah and I successfully launched our product, resulting in significant financial gains. We went from living in cramped apartments to roomy, cozy houses, making a big improvement in our living situation. When my father-in-law heard about my achievements, he started seeing me in a better light and began casually calling me. At first, I was hesitant to interact with him, but after Emily and Noah encouraged me to forgive the past and move forward, I chose to pick up his calls. Over time, I grew more comfortable with the idea and invited my in-laws to our new home. When my father-in-law accepted the invitation and saw our luxurious house, he was surprised by how well things were going for me, as he never expected my success. His mistreatment and bad behavior actually motivated me to work hard for success. However, he kept pushing both Miley and me to have kids despite our own feelings and choices. Ironically, the same person who initially didn't want us to be together now suddenly wanted us to have children. Realizing he was intruding in our lives, I kept a reasonable distance from him. However, 
Just last Christmas, Miley's parents strongly suggested that we throw a big dinner at our house and include a wide range of guests. In response, I invited Noah's family, my own parents, and my brothers, creating a sense of togetherness and celebration. Miley's parents also wanted me to invite their friends and relatives to the Christmas dinner, as they hadn't been present at our wedding. It became clear that they weren't only interested in introducing me to their acquaintances but also in showing off their connections in our fancy house and wealth. Despite what they wanted, I chose to keep the guest list smaller for a more intimate gathering. However, Miley did invite a few of her parents' friends and relatives to the Christmas dinner party. My parents and Noah's family came dressed nicely and appropriately for the occasion. I was surprised, though, when Miley's family arrived in very formal and extravagant outfits that seemed more suited for a wedding than a casual get-together. To my astonishment, some of my in-laws' friends and relatives acted as if they were in their own home, dancing and using our space without any restraint. Miley wore a short black dress, and the lively atmosphere turned our house into a bustling party that felt more like a bar than a traditional Christmas dinner. This strong difference from our usual calm and simple family gatherings made me feel uncomfortable. Seeing how things were going, my parents, who preferred a quieter atmosphere, chose to leave early. They could tell that the gathering was turning into something more like a disco than a traditional Christmas celebration. As the night went on, my father-in-law was busy showing off our house, cars, and stuff to his friends, while their kids joined Miley on the dance floor. Meanwhile, Noah's family and I stayed focused on enjoying our dinner and didn't pay much attention to these unfamiliar guests. After we ate, Noah and Emily decided to leave early since they felt they had done their part for the evening. Feeling really unhappy with how the party was going, I talked to Miley about how frustrated I was and said we needed to wrap it up. Miley understood and told me to go upstairs and rest while she took care of things. With a pounding headache and getting more and more annoyed at Miley, her parents, and their strange friends, I locked myself in my room and tried to find some comfort in sleep. I woke up around 3 a.m. from a bad dream and noticed that Miley wasn't in bed next to me. Curious, I went downstairs to see what was going on. I was shocked and getting angrier when I saw that the whole house was dark with no lights on. The shocking truth awaited me when I found that the previous guests were still relaxing on the carpets and sofas, seemingly not bothered by the late hour. Discovering this made me even more furious. I got angrier when I couldn't find Miley or her parents in the main living areas, so I started searching in other rooms. Eventually, I found her parents sleeping in our designated guest room. Feeling more worried, I decided to call Miley's phone to see where she was. I heard her ringtone coming from another guest room. Something didn't feel right, so I hung up quickly and carefully went into the room to see what was happening. When I opened the door, I was shocked to see Miley alone in the room with a man I didn't know doing something very inappropriate. I was so angry and couldn't believe it. I grabbed my phone and recorded a video of what I saw in a burst of anger. I confronted Miley, splashing water on her. She was surprised to see me because she probably thought I was asleep and wouldn't find out until the morning. I punched the guy and kicked him out of my house, yelling and causing a scene. When Miley's parents and the other guests woke up from the commotion, Miley's father explained that there was a misunderstanding and the guy was a friend's son. When Miley cried and begged me for another chance, I told him to be quiet and I slapped her. Yet her father kept trying to explain things away, making the situation seem less serious and hinting that I was overreacting. His attitude of entitlement became more obvious now that I was wealthy, as he was shocked by the idea of me leaving his daughter. He suggested that we wait until morning to deal with it as a family matter so we wouldn't cause a scene in front of our guests. I had reached my limit and didn't care about the guests or my unfaithful wife anymore, so I firmly asked everyone to leave my house, even though it was very late at night. After that, I took the necessary steps to end my marriage by sending divorce papers to Miley. The process of finalizing the divorce took months, during which Noah and my other friends supported me. Sadly, my greedy father-in-law tried to manipulate and get money from me, but luckily, I had strong evidence of his daughter's unfaithfulness, which helped me. Even though Miley kept asking for another chance, admitting her affairs and feeling sorry, I stayed firm in my decision. She tried to blame her father and thought I would forgive her easily, but I knew she needed to take responsibility for her actions in order to truly grow. Initially, I had given her chances because of her entitled behavior from how she was raised, but her cheating on me was a big betrayal of trust that I can't ignore. 
Forgiving infidelity is hard for me because I believe it's a choice people make. Miley is an adult and knew what she was doing, so she needs to own up to it. It was clear that Miley had a strained relationship with her parents, partly because of the big difference between the life she had with me and how she grew up. Even though Miley keeps trying to reach out to me, I've made up my mind. There's no chance for us to get back together. I'm happy now. I'm in a relationship with Noah's sister, and I genuinely like how things are. Sometimes being alone is much better than being around people who act greedy and entitled. People like that don't match up with my values and can mess up any sense of peace or getting along. Thanks for sticking around to hear the whole story. If you enjoyed it, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Leave a comment to let us know what you think about the story.